of the downtown atmosphere of this Mexican city. I love Mexico. I like their way of life. Nobody knew me. And I thought, this is a good place to live. Meanwhile, back in the U.S., Margaret may have been gone, but she was not forgotten. She was on the FBI's most wanted list. This is going to be a true test for Margaret Rudin. 53 years old, no criminal record. She has to figure out how to survive life on the run. I don't know how she did it. I really don't. Well, one would think she had help um, or that she had studied it very, very closely. One useful tool that Margaret has always possessed is her charm. Men do like her. So what happens next is practically the making of a movie of the week. She meets a guy who claims to be a Spanish bank robber, also on the run. Oh, it was great. He was a wonderful companion. He was not my boyfriend. He taught me how to be a fugitive. The number one thing is always have a bag packed. Have money, ID, clothes. Make sure you have whatever it is you need the most in that bag. Margaret becomes this master of disguise with different aliases, wearing different wigs. She even had colored contacts. But eventually, she decided she was ready to come back to the U.S. Life on the run is not what it's cracked up to be. All right, it's a tough existence. You want to live in Mexico under an alias, scrapping it out? Or will you take your chances coming back to the United States? I had friends that came to visit me in Mexico. And then they asked me if I wanted to come back and live with them in Phoenix. Once you have children and grandchildren, you cannot go somewhere else and live and act like you're having a normal life. Margaret has to figure out a way to safely get back into the United States. So once again, she uses her charm and convinces a gentleman who lives in the same apartment building in Guadalajara to help her. Joe Lundergan was a Boston fireman, retired. Very, very, very needy. He was never my boyfriend. I have never been that desperate in my life. I said, I've decided I'm going back to the States. And he said, I will get you across the border. We got to the border where you're on US territory. And I said, oh, okay, go. You can both go. Margaret and Joe Lundergan part ways. He heads back home to the Boston area, and she settles into a new life in Phoenix, assuming yet another identity using the name of her friend. Margaret is in Phoenix. She's gotten herself a room at the YMCA. She once worked in the hotel business, so that's a bit of a resume, and she uses it to get a job at the San Carlos Hotel. My poor manager, he used to say, if you ever tell me you're gonna quit, I'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I was going to have to quit at some point. Margaret was the subject of as high profile a case as you'll ever get. What could drive a woman to murder? Love? Sex? Money? Well, for the woman in our next case, you're going to have to answer that question yourself. And she was repeatedly on America's Most Wanted. And she was the Black Widow, right? This was the label. Where's the Black Widow? Have you seen Margaret Rudin? If you spot Margaret Rudin, call our hotline at 1-800-CRIME-TV. Someone that she worked with saw the America's Most Wanted and said, hey, that's a nap, and she called the tip line and the police officers responded. So the cops showed up at my door and said, somebody thinks you are so-and-so and we need to see your ID. And I had gone the day before and got legit Arizona ID with my picture on it, you know, and they said, let me check it in the computer, came back and said, nothing there. So they left. I picked up my bag, called a limo service, which we used at the hotel, and I said, would you please pick me up on the side entrance? So the limo took me to where I wanted to go, and I was a fugitive again. It is funny. I mean, how often could you be that lucky? It's time for another chapter in Margaret's life on the run, and she heads east. 
But then a pizza delivery man shows up at Margaret Rudin's door. Is he there to deliver an end to her lucky streak? Revere, Massachusetts is a community that's just six miles north of Boston. It's a blue collar community, very diverse, and with USA's oldest beach is Revere Beach. This area was kind of known as the Boston mob community, but this is where they operated in that general vicinity. No one asked many questions in Revere. Margaret barely makes it out of Phoenix when she hears from a friend that Joe Lundigan needs her help. And Joe said, I have two knee surgeries and hip surgery. And would you ask Margaret if she would come take care of me? Margaret is able to, in Revere, carve out a new life on the run. Margaret lived in a kind of a rundown little apartment. You had to walk up two or three flights of stairs. It was kind of grimy and dirty and dark. It was so different than her life of luxury in Las Vegas. Her new name is Lee Brown. The other one was Susan Simmons, and she had at least two, if not three wigs. And she wore them frequently. You know, it wasn't to be deceptive in any way. It's just my sense of style. people of Revere, they all liked Margaret, right? She was real popular. I first met Margaret back in October of 99. I'd do photocopies for her. Then she would bring me in some IDs and I would laminate them for her. And uh, she was very pleasant, really nice. I really like Massachusetts. I like the people. They're very honest and sincere and forthright. Even on the run for Margaret, there's always time for romance. Turns out Margaret's got a new boyfriend. He's a younger guy who lives in the same building as Margaret, but one floor down. The idea that she is the focus of an international woman hunt. You spot Margaret Rudin, call our hotline of 1-800-CRIME-TV. But then also live a somewhat normal life is uncanny. But when you're on the lam, it's the little things that get you. One of Margaret's seemingly mundane activities proves to be her undoing. She goes frequently to the Revere post office. And they got a tip, hey, this woman looks like the fugitive that's being broadcast on America's Most Wanted. They got a tip that Margaret Rudin was in fact mailing packages from a Revere post office so we immediately went over to the post office and showed her picture. Post office people said, yeah, that's her. That's her, and she lives right over there. And that's how they found me. November 5th, 1999. The team got together and decided to position ourselves around here. They came up with kind of a unique sting operation to pry her out, which was a law enforcement officer posed as a pizza delivery man. We had Officer Joe Pepe on a Domino's shirt, a Domino's hat. We all went up the stairs, gained peaceful entry, filed up the stairs to her apartment, which is in the second floor, and proceeded to knock on the door. When they said, pizza man, and I went to Joe's bedroom and I said, answer the door. And as soon as the door opened, we rushed in and the first person I came to was Mr. Lundergan. I pat him down really quickly, shifted him, and passed him to the next guy. They came in like gangbusters. They're coming down this narrow hallway, and they're coming in with their guns drawn. There's a uh, entrance to a bathroom. We open the door, and we see a female in there. All I did was step back into the door of the bathroom, and immediately, a young, he was a highway patrolman. He was a wonderful young man. He came in and he said, are you Margaret Rudin? I said, of course I am. You know I am. I said to her, you know what this is about, Margaret? She goes, yeah, this is about Las Vegas. At that point, she was placed in, in a handcuffs with no issues whatsoever. 
This would be a good example of how she looked upon the, uh, her arrest. And then she had um, all her things scattered all over the room to include wigs. And then we came across several IDs. She took deliberate, proactive measures to conceal her identity. People of Revere were absolutely stunned beyond belief when it came out that she was wanted for murder in Las Vegas. This doesn't jive with the person that I knew. The pleasantness of her, it just, that's not something that you could hide. I don't know, I, I, I tend to have my doubts. Margaret Rudin's run from the law ended in Revere. Indicted more than two years ago for the 1994 murder of her husband, Las Vegas realtor Ron Rudin. Now that she's caught, she's the focus of everybody's attention. Margaret Rudin's fugitive days were over, but not her efforts to escape justice. And they're bringing her from Massachusetts back to Las Vegas. It sells papers. It keeps the hoopla going. This is what Margaret Rudin looked like when corrections officers booked her Sunday morning. They convict somebody before they're ever setting foot into a courtroom. And now all this anticipation is building as day one in the courtroom is on the horizon. You would be relieved, you know, to find out if in fact she really did it. And we would find out in court. And we could see it whenever we wanted to. There's a lot here at stake. Margaret's life is at stake. But would Margaret's fate hinge on the testimony of a surprising witness for the prosecution? Her own sister. What did Margaret respond? She said, I don't give a f When you think of Las Vegas, you think of all that sizzle on the strip. Now it's all moved to the Clark County Courthouse, where Margaret Rudin is about to face trial for murder. March 2nd, 2001, it is time for the Rudin trial. Adding to the drama inside the courtroom, this trial would make its way into living rooms across America. It was put on cable television. Good morning and welcome to Open Court here on Court TV. I think this was the first trial to go gavel to gavel on Court TV. State of Nevada versus Margaret Rudin. The world is watching as this woman who has been on the run, accused of murder, is now sitting in the defendant's chair. I did not know the magnitude until trial started. There's a lot riding on the case. And I remember really feeling the weight of that case. I've never talked about the Margaret Rune case. Are stay ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. They hand me the file and I he says, this is going to be a tough one. <laughs> Mr. Owens. In opening statements, the prosecution portrays Margaret to the jury as a ruthless, greedy woman who will do anything to get her husband's millions. The evidence will show at the time of Ronald Rudin's death, Margaret Rudin was a 60% beneficiary of the properties and assets that were in that trust. And in comes Michael Amador. All right, Mr. Amador. In his opening statement, defense attorney Michael Amador raises a lot of eyebrows when he seems more intent on talking about himself rather than his client. I could be a, a wonderful, caring father coaching soccer and basketball and helping kids with homework and doing all those things. It was hours of rambling and talking about himself. This is a great day for me. This is a culmination of a career. The purpose of a opening statement is just to indicate what the evidence is going to tend to show and not go into your personal beliefs and your passion and your soccer uh, dad i never heard that in an opening statement in my life i remember minutes into the opening statement of the defense saying to my co-counsel hey give me a cigarette this thing's over and i don't smoke things started out bad and they went to worse by the first day prosecutors lay out their case that margaret shot but the place for what what type of a scene was this? Suicide. And could you tell the jury where that was? In the bedroom. In the middle of the trial, this astounding revelation comes to light when the jurors learned that Ron Rudin's third wife, Peggy, had actually shot herself in the head. Reported to the ATF that the gun went missing from his collection back in 1988, right at the time 
that Margaret was moving out of the house. A year in the marriage when they were having the divorce problems. That gun had turned up missing about the time that he and Margaret had separated. And he believed that, sh that she had taken the gun. If she somehow is so clever that she's kept this gun under lock and key, such that, that no one knows where it is, she brings it out right to the place where it could be found. And that's what you have to believe beyond a reasonable doubt. One of the major pieces that the state honed in on was a to Margaret Rudin. And to help make that connection, the prosecution calls Bruce Honeback. He's an antique dealer who claimed he sold the trunk to Margaret. Can you tell me when it was that you sold this particular trunk to Margaret Rudin? At the very beginning of our relationship. So late spring, early summer? Yes, sir. Of 1994? Yes, sir. Investigators always believed that Margaret had helped transporting that trunk, and they pointed the finger at her suspected paramour, Yehuda Sharon. In what looks to be a major nail in the proverbial coffin of Margaret's case, Yehuda Sharon is called to the stand as a prosecution witness. Yehuda, okay, check this out. They told him, we're going to charge you with the same murder that we're charging her with. However, if you flip, We'll give you total. Swear I won't forget this, why do I regret this? In my mind reckless, thoughts are feeling endless Sitting up I'm breathless, anxiety's infectious I feel so defenseless, betrayed and embarrassed I hate being open, I hate being broken I feel like an ocean filled up with emotion Anger ain't a potion, rub it on like lotion I can feel it soaking, reopen, the scars have awoken I can't move on till I let go I feel so lost, never at home Need to be strong, every breath hold Cause I can't move on till I let go I can't move on till I let go I feel so lost, never at home Need to be strong, every breath hold Cause I can't move on till I let go And make gives me chills A nice road it feels I slip off the pill and cry
crash all the shit will buy every shield I can't move on till I let go I feel so lost, never at home Need to be strong, every breath hold Cause I can't move on till I let go I can't move on till I let go I feel so lost, never at home Need to be strong, every breath hold Cause I can't move on till I let go immunity. Now what, what's up with that? I know that I received immunity. From what? I have no idea. Did you kill Ron Rudin? No, I did not. Did you help kill Ron Rudin? No, I did not. Did you help dispose of his body? No, I did, did not. Did you go up to Nelson's Landing in December of 1994? No, I did not. And <laughs> It still baffles me to this day. How do you give him immunity and you don't know what he's going to testify to? No charges were ever brought against Sharon. It turns out that the attempt to get something out of Yehuda Sharon just fizzled. The prosecution now puts a lot of its hopes on the next witness, Margaret's sister Donna. Why is it that you testify as you have today? Because it's the truth. Because I felt it's what I had to do. Donna wasn't my friend. She never had been my friend. She's very difficult and I don't trust her any further than I can throw her. Donna testified about how she helped Margaret take financial documents from Ron's desk. Donna's not finished. She tells the jury that the day after Ron went missing, Margaret said to her, you know, I talked to the police about Ron in the past tense. I said, I hope that doesn't mean that you know something. And what did Margaret respond? She said, I don't give a And the surprises and curveballs just keep coming. Early in the trial, Amador drops this bombshell. The problem here is not a lack of diligence on the part of myself and my staff, but an insufficient time to fully prepare the entire case or the time and the funds to fully investigate and interview all of the witnesses. The issue is Margaret Rudin's right to a fair trial. Astoundingly, Michael Amador, the defense attorney, asks the judge to declare a mistrial. I will also be moving to withdraw as attorney of record on behalf of Margaret Rudin. Michael Amador wasn't who he said he was. One thing that I've learned over the years, you better have a voice because you can't depend on somebody else. The trial is not a perfect thing. Ms. Rudin has not been denied her rights under the Constitution. Based upon the foregoing, the motion for mistrial is denied. But the closing act of this three-ring circus of a trial was yet to come. Tom Pataro takes over as lead defense attorney, and he pulls a stunt that will make jaws drop in the courtroom again. So they have to go shoot here, either bang, bang, one or two times, correct? Yes. Bang, bang. I sort of blew up on that. I made a ruling and a stick. The jury in this case has seen all kinds of craziness and it's not over yet. Now the defense wants to recreate the actual crime scene in the middle of the courtroom. So the body, the whole body would have to go this way to get the head now facing the back. Well, the idea was to, to demonstrate to the jurors. Listen to me. 
You better not start yelling, Mr. Patero. I made a ruling and it sticks. Not at all. I, I sort of blew up on that. I said, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. It was a, cir it was a circus. <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, he, he got upset a, a few times, uh, but that's what he gets paid for. After over nine weeks, the prosecution and the defense finally rest in one of the longest trials in Vegas history, sending jurors off to deliberate. The real nasty down and out fight doesn't happen in the courtroom. The real fight starts in the jury room. I'm Ron Vest. Uh, I was the foreman on the Margaret Rudin, Ron Rudin millionaire murder trial. Ron Vest, yeah. Um, very overbearing, but he was very angry because he actually felt on that first day of deliberation that he'd be home by dinner. According to Ron, this case was a slam dunk, uh, and it really wasn't. This thing was a slam dunk with a stepladder. I mean, it just was. And when you start adding up who had the means, who had the motive, who had the opportunity to do it, there's only one person. And then we had the lone holdout. She couldn't point to evidence as to why Margaret didn't. Wait, there's your reasonable doubt. We went through six days of deliberation where I was not budging. The foreman wanted me to dismiss juror number 11 because she was the only holdout. And I said, no, her actions weren't such that she needs to be excused. And if it's going to be a hung jury, so be it. Ms. Rudin, will you stand up, please? Have you arrived at a verdict? Yes, sir, we have. So it was a packed courtroom. Cameras were rolling. There was a lot of suspense because the jury had been out for quite a while. Oh, it's tense. It was really tense. I can remember standing up and reading the charges. And then I said on the count two, on the murder count in the first degree, we find the defendant. And I can remember pausing briefly and symbolically. We find the defendant guilty. <laughs> when the verdict was read, you hear somebody sobbing. That was me. Because I caved. And all I could do was look up at Tom Patero and Margaret Rudin and mouth, I'm sorry. I'm very ashamed of myself that I let that happen. It's the biggest regret of my life. It really is. When they came back saying guilty of all counts, I was, I was surprised. I was surprised at that. Now, juror number 11 should have stuck to her guns. When she came out guilty, you know, I, we were all relieved, you know, that she was going to go to prison. Margaret Rudin was looking at me when I said guilty, because I know she did it, and she didn't even blink. It was a blackout. It's sort of like when they cops came to tell me about Ron and then your mind goes I can't take anymore I don't know how to take it the court sentences you to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole none of this ever had to happen what no one really knew at the time except for a handful of people was that Margaret Rudin was offered plea deals multiple times there had been so many issues with regards to the trial itself that we were concerned about you know what would happen with appeals. They, being the prosecution, were going to give her credit for time served. I think I even told her, I said, so you do another year, year and a half, and you'd be out of uh, custody. She didn't hesitate one bit. Oh, no, Judge, uh, I'm innocent. I'm not taking any deal. I can't plead to something I didn't do. Five times I was offered a plea deal. I never considered I'm not going to admit it. I don't care if I'm 110 and I'm still waiting. I'm not going to admit to something I didn't do. And that takes a lot of chutzpah. Even afterwards, one of the prosecutors came up to me and said, you know, I'll, I'll still give it to you. Dumbfounded. Dumbfounded that she rejected the offer. OK, then. Maybe she is innocent. Wow, Margaret. <laughs> I, I honestly don't know what to say to that. I really don't. That's unbelievable. She went out to the Florence McClure uh, prison out in the Smiley Road. It's uh, on the outskirts of Las Vegas. Smiley Road. Who would put a women's prison on Smiley Road? What a sense of humor. She wasn't being broken by the system. She had a belief that she was going to get through it. 
it hardens you. You know, the only way you can bear a lot of the things is you have to only think about what's good still. One person who reached out to Margaret in prison was holdout juror Corinne Kovacs. She had befriended and written Margaret during her long prison stint. The catalyst for me was I needed to, I needed to personally apologize to this woman for what I felt was um, my fault. Well, you know, the travesty was my fault. As the years went by, there were lingering questions of whether or not she actually got a fair trial. This was a show. I mean, it, it was just terrible. And, and could she have received a fair trial? Yeah, she could have received a fair trial and, and better defense counsel, but what do, you do? what do you do? 42 years, that is the worst trial that I've ever had. The only regret I have, should I have um, allowed a mistrial in the very beginning because of Mike Amador? It might have had a different outcome for Margaret Rudin. But now, 20 years after her conviction, could unsolved mysteries about Ron Rudin's death finally lead to Margaret's name being cleared? There was four sets of footprints, buddy footprints in the car. Uh, they never established whose footprints they are. There's all sorts of questions and who are the four people in that car? This case is still pending. I don't know if you know that. Tune in for the next chapter. She wants to prove she did not do it. Wow. Even behind bars, Margaret Rudin was insistent she was innocent. She files an appeal to have her conviction. And she said, yeah. It was ineffective as is the counsel. I'm going to grant this and grant a new trial. Well, there you go. But then two years later, the Nevada Supreme Court reversed that decision over a legal technicality. I was just looking at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals website and saw one that involved a murder in Las Vegas. And I thought, well, that looks kind of interesting. I just started getting mad and I started reading it over again because I couldn't believe it. So I went out there and met her, and then I agreed to represent her if she got a new trial. There's no fingerprints, DNA, no forensics that puts her at the crime scene. She's not stupid enough to kill Ron Rudin in the bedroom of their home, put him in a trunk from her antique store, haul him out, and burn him and leave him. I would really like to be able to exonerate my name. Yes, I have the energy to sit through another trial. Innocent, I would be proven innocent. Margaret appealed again, and the case is currently pending, waiting for a federal judge to make a ruling on whether she gets a new trial. Why are you convinced that she didn't do it? Because there's, the physical evidence just doesn't add up. They didn't have a strong enough lead defense attorney to challenge all the evidence that was admitted. Margaret had taken the gun and used it to kill him. She had an opportunity to take the weapon in 88, and she probably just kept possession of it for all those years. Or taken by person or persons unknown during my wife's packing her furniture and personified, he sold the trunk to Margaret. Can you tell me when it was that you uh, sold this particular trunk to Margaret Rudin? Right at the very beginning of our, well, at the very beginning of our relationship. So here we got a guy that supposedly sold her the trunk. To me, that was one of the bigger factors in the conviction. It turns out the guy who originally sold the witness that trunk came. He's like, we carry roller skates in. He said, that's it. And I said, Bruce, that little case is too small to put a diver in. But the jury didn't hear from that man until after the defense had rested. Mullinax contends by that time what he had to say was ineffective. We didn't know it at the time. That's where the problems were. We were finding facts out as they were coming. And as an attorney, you know the facts and you're able to defend against them. Quite truthfully, if we had that testimony at print, they never would have spent all the time talking about trunks. Theories surrounding Ron's murder that remain unanswered a quarter of a century later, including the riddle of what was found inside Ron Rudin's abandoned Cadillac. There was four sets of footprints, muddy footprints in the car. Uh, they never established whose footprints they are. They also found clothes in the trunk of the car. Those clothes were never tested for DNA. Instead of answering- Still gonna have the proof somewhere. Bring it out. Let's have it under DNA standards today. 
Even former prosecutor Gary Guyman says that there were investigative avenues that weren't fully pursued. Like that huge Lee Canyon real estate deal Rudin was working on that was set to close just days after he went missing. Yeah, I always believed there was fodder in the Lee Canyon business dealings, but it never got developed. And there's just seems like there's so much left in the process. He was involved with some very wide assortment of not so nice people. And when they found a body out there at the lake, I mean, for me, that just kind of had mob written all over it. I just hope that the court in Las Vegas would order a new trial and that this matter could be settled. The, the chances, I don't know. It's up to a judge right now. Okay, but this is Vegas. Would you say the odds are in your favor? I would say the odds should be in our favor because, remember, Margaret was granted a new trial back in 2008. The infamous convicted killer, Margaret Rudin, dubbed the Black Widow of Las Vegas, has just been let out of prison. Margaret Rudin's life is about to change drastically. What lies ahead does not involve handcuffs, bars, or prison guards. Oh my God, more than one time did I say to her on the phone, you're going to get out, and the day you are, I'm going to be there. Juror Corrine Kovacs. She had befriended and written Margaret during her long prison stint. Wow. Hi. Am I going to get to see you later? That was wonderful. It was high time, but you could see that being in prison took a toll because this was a very, very, she's a very pretty woman. After her release, Margaret moved back to the Chicago area. Now she's 77 years old. The world had changed, life had changed, my children had changed. I'm living alone for the first time probably in my life. It's a serious adjustment. I knew nothing about Facebook, our smartphones, our computers, our the way of life that's just so taken for granted now. She's a great grandmother now. She's spending time with her, her daughter, her granddaughter, her great granddaughters. And now if I had my life to live over again, I would stay right here in Illinois and never ever have subjected my kids or myself to Vegas. All of the things that influenced my life as I got into the relationship with Ron Rudin. I miss him. I look at the pictures now. I think I, I wish he was here. I wish I had had more uh, pictures with my husband. I I think because of the details of the murder, how heinous it was, and because it was motivated by money, by greed, that personally, I think she should have stayed behind bars. I did not kill Ron. And I have no fear of meeting God and saying, I did not. I'm not going to have my children or my grandchildren live with that. Look at her, her mother did it. I don't care what you think, I don't care what you think, I don't care what you think, God and I know. Duck down! An enemy has been defeated! Your team has destroyed a tower! defeated.